When it comes to illegal drug smuggling, we know two names all too well, Pablo Escobar and El Chapo. They've both been the subject of countless television series, movies, books, and various other pieces of entertainment. Still, while they both became famous for similar things, they're incredibly different people. We're going to take a look at Pablo Escobar and El Chapo and see how they compare which one was the best and worst at what they did throughout their high-profile drug trafficking careers. Childhood, Escobar, born 1949. Pablo Emilio Escobar Gaviria was born on December 1st, 1949, in the Antioquia Department, Colombia, in the city of Rio Negro. Escobar's mother was a schoolteacher while his father was a cattle farmer. His family was large, as Escobar was one of seven kids. Overall, his family's financial situation wasn't dire. They managed to not only survive, but live a reasonably comfortable life. Escobar lived in an area with a lot of narcotics, so he began purchasing marijuana for himself to enjoy. Still, he saw that something about the narcotics business could earn him a lot of money. He made an important observation about American tourists, who he realized were embracing cocaine in abundance. Escobar had been engaged in numerous illegal activities. Still, seeing the power of this prevalent white powder in Colombia, he knew there was an opportunity to make money, and a lot of it. So, how does that compare to El Chapo's childhood? Childhood, El Chapo, born 1957. Joaquin Arquivaldo Guzman Luera was born on April 4th, 1957, in Sinaloa, Mexico. His family wasn't wealthy, and he lived in the rural part of Sinaloa, in the rural community of La Tuna, Badiroguato. His mother was the one who kept their large household together, while Joaquin's father was a cattle rancher, just like Escobar's. However, contradictory evidence suggests that it's possible, not confirmed, but possible, that he was an opioid farmer. His childhood saw Joaquin adopting a business mindset by selling oranges on the street. He'd eventually drop out of school and begin working with his father. However, as he grew older, he began turning to more lucrative sources of income. El Chapo was kicked out of his home while he was in his teens. He was forced to make it on his own. At age 15, he began selling marijuana. Eventually, he'd quit the farm work and turn his full attention to what was once a side hustle. Like Escobar in his childhood, this was just the beginning of his foray into the narcotics market. Rise to power, Escobar. Escobar's rise to power truly began in 1975. While by this point he'd already been buying, refining, and selling cocaine to the United States, it was about to get serious. He'd already been doing well on his own, but when the Medellin cartel lost their leader, drug lord Fabio Restrepo, Escobar stepped in and filled the vacuum left by the slain leader. This self-made millionaire was on the way to billionaire status. His reign as the leader of the Medellin cartel was marked by exceptional growth and domination of the narcotics trade across North and South America. He massively expanded the organization's production, distribution, and in turn, their influence and bottom line. It didn't take long for Escobar to be responsible for 80% of the United States illegal cocaine supply. Rise to power, El Chapo. El Chapo started early, working for a series of drug cartels in Mexico. In the 70s, he worked for drug lord Hector El Guerra Palma. He oversaw the transportation of drugs and their shipments from the Sierra Madre to urban areas near the US-Mexico border. In the 80s, he worked for Mexico's leading crime syndicate, the Guadalajara Cartel. They were all spearheaded by Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, also known as El Padrino, or the Godfather. His reputation was well known amongst his colleagues and adored by the higher-ups. He was ruthless. If shipments were short or not on time, or if anyone showed disloyalty, there was only one answer, death. He was constantly given more power, and when El Padrino was arrested in 1985, he became the leader and quickly worked to become a prominent figure in the narcotics trade that ruled South America. His ascension to the throne wasn't achieved without bloodshed. It was a truly violent time, but the ruthless El Chapo came out victorious in the end. Personal life, Escobar. On a more personal level, in 1975, Escobar married Maria Victoria Henao Vallejo, a 15-year-old at the time. They'd have two children together, Juan Pablo and Manuela. It was widely known that Pablo wasn't a faithful man, and he regularly engaged in infidelity. He had a preference, and judging by his wife's age when the two married, it's likely easy to understand what that preference was. Despite the affairs, the two remained together for the remainder of Pablo's life. Personal life, El Chapo. El Chapo's personal life differs from Escobar's. He married Alejandrina Maria Salazar Hernández in 1977. The couple had three kids, and they lived in Jesus Maria, Sinaloa. Their marriage wouldn't last forever, as he eventually fell in love with a bank clerk named Estela Peña of Nayarit, whom he'd kidnapped and slept with. Addicted to love in all of the worst places, El Chapo would marry again in the mid-80s to Griselda López Pérez, with whom he'd have four children. The third time really is the charm. Well, not really. 
he went and married another girl, this time 18-year-old Emma Coronel Aispuro in 2007, and Lopez Perez was actually arrested in 2010. The couple had twins, and she was later arrested in 2021 after admitting to helping El Chapo run his empire. Many of El Chapo's children and former wives are either in jail or dead as a result of being wrapped up in a dangerous world of narcotics. While Escobar was unfaithful, between the two of them, he was more of the family man, as much as one can be in this fast and loose world of the illegal drug trade. Influence Escobar Escobar held considerable leverage and therefore had a significant amount of influence over the government, local law enforcement, and just about everything he felt necessary to intervene in. In addition, he was known for being a ruthless man, and he had a method for dealing with enemies, plato a plomo, which means silver or lead. His methods for politicians started at bribery, but if you continued opposing him, he'd make sure you never live long enough to do anything that might hurt him. He didn't kill based on any criteria other than who was the enemy. If you were rich, poor, a politician, or a farmer, these details simply never factored into the equation. The amount of people Escobar's been responsible for killing is unknown, but the estimates run in the thousands. His most targeted victims were judges, politicians, journalists, criminals, and any member of law enforcement. Influence El Chapo Drug lords know how to obtain influence, money, and threats. He had everyone in his back pocket all across Mexico. When he was arrested in 2001, he paid $2.5 million to escape from prison. Considering how many times he's escaped over the years, it's safe to assume he's paid a lot of money to prison guards and wardens in order to silence them. While people were searching for him, he brazenly had a wedding with politicians and policemen in attendance. There might have been an aggressive war against cartels and drugs in 2006 and 2007, but he was living his best life with the very people pretending to be after him. Pinnacle of Power, Escobar the mid-80s saw Escobar at the height of power. He was ranked the seventh richest person in the world by Forbes. In addition, he had created an empire that included criminals, soldiers, mansions, apartments, airstrips, planes, and even a zoo, all of which was spread across Colombia, further expanding his influence. He made sure to focus on the Medellin area, ensuring that the residents of the city felt his presence as a positive thing, not a negative. His cartel spent millions renovating and building schools, parks, stadiums, churches, and homes. He was, to some, a hero, and for others, the world's most wanted criminal. Pinnacle of power, El Chapo El Chapo was diversifying. He wasn't just selling tons of cocaine, but also meth. He manufactured and sold directly to the market. It was almost like a farm-to-table type of vibe, but more deadly, I guess. His power in the region was only expanding. He had so many people working for him, and his empire was expanding rapidly. He was the new godfather of various cartels across Mexico. They all answered to him. The Fall, Escobar For over a decade, Escobar had been a target of law enforcement agencies in Colombia and various parts of the world, especially the United States. Finally, as a result of his intense scrutiny from the US and the inability to influence them as effectively as he had the Colombian government, he made a deal. He turned himself in and spent five years in prison. The catch, however, was that he designed the private prison himself and choose its location. Taking advantage of this, Escobar built himself a palace. La Catedral had features that didn't make it worthy of the title prison. Jacuzzis, endless rooms, a dance floor, a soccer field, and more populated this luxurious prison. He still ran his empire during this time and had endless guests visiting. This was house arrest, not prison. He took it a step too far. According to the Colombian government, in 1992, when he ordered the hit on two of his underlings, the two were brought to his prison and murdered. They then planned to take him to a regular prison, and that's when he escaped. Everyone was looking for him, and eventually he was found in 1993. They wanted him in jail, but a shootout ensued, and Escobar ultimately was taken out for good. He was shot in the torso and leg, and a fatal shot to the head. Nobody is sure if Escobar committed suicide, knowing it was game over, or if one of the Colombian police officers got lucky. Either way, Escobar's reign over the Medellin cartel was over. The empire went into ruins. Without their fearless leader, their influence dwindled until it was non-existent. The Fall, El Chapo Eventually, in 1993, Guzman would be arrested and sentenced to 20 years in a maximum security prison. He managed to bribe guards, so he constantly had visitors and still managed to run his empire. He escaped in 2001 thanks to a bribe made out to a prison guard. By 2009, he'd successfully expanded his empire while in hiding and even became a billionaire. In 2012, the US were over his antics and froze his accounts as well as offering rewards for information, and in 2014, they got him. The US wanted him, but Mexico was convinced he wouldn't escape again. They were wrong. 18 months later, he escaped through the most insane underground tunnel system that had been dug under the prison. 
directly into his cell. In January 2016, Guzman was again apprehended and taken back to the same prison before he was ultimately moved to a prison near the border. In January of 2017, he was extradited to the US, where he remained while he was on trial. The trial went on for a little over a year and resulted in El Chapo being found guilty and sentenced to life in prison plus 30 years and an order to pay $12.6 billion in restitution. The Legacy Escobar There's no arguing that Escobar has managed to sustain a pretty impressive influence. He's been the subject of so many movies, series, books, podcasts, merchandise, you name it. While he's viewed as a criminal, he's been almost glamorized to a degree. Now, when people think of Escobar, it's usually not in fear or disgust, but as if they're remembering a legend. The legacy, El Chapo. El Chapo's legacy is different from Escobar's. When El Chapo was sent away to jail for life, the cartel carried on without him. Unlike the Medellin cartel, which took a nosedive, his cartel remained one of the largest narcotics importers. Like Escobar, he's had movies, series, games, and books based on his life and crimes, but definitely not to the same extent. Perhaps El Chapo's crowning achievement is the intricate ways he smuggled drugs across the border, or in some cases, under the border. He had a series of tunnels under the border that were air-conditioned, which sounds insane, but it's very true. Escobar versus El Chapo They both lost in the end, but Escobar was a winner until he died, while El Chapo languishes in prison, defeated. Much of El Chapo's success is owed to Escobar's death. When Guzman's Sinaloa cartel began rising through the ranks in 1989 and 1990, it was because of the Medellin cartel's waning influence. There's a stark difference between these two kingpins. One was integral to the survival of a thriving cartel, and the other, while influential, lost everything. Power, money, influence in his cartel, all of it just gone. If this was a battle of the kingpins and drug lords, Escobar wins. While Escobar is no longer with us and El Chapo is behind bars, there's no stopping what the world of narcotics is. There may never be another Escobar or El Chapo, but there's always a wannabe looking to be the kingpin.